fantastic. Welcome everybody to uh, Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce uh, webinar. Uh, I'm just going to ramble on for a couple of minutes while we uh, let the participants in um, and then I'll hand you over to our chair, Chris Parker. Um, welcome on this beautiful sunny day. Um, I'm going to share a slide with you while we welcome our guests in into our audience. Our panelists are all ready with, uh, with their teas and biscuits ready to, ready to join in this, this webinar. So the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce, those of you who don't know Chambers of Commerce, we're the um, fifth largest in, in the accredited network with the British Chambers of Commerce. And uh, we are the second largest for inward investment. Uh, representing the, the Thames Valley with over 4,000 members. So welcome, and I hope you enjoyed this webinar. I will now hand you over to uh, Chris Parker, our chair. Over to you, Chris. Chris, you've got, mute, Chris. you've got your mute on. I hope that's my only uh, only faux pas of the afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me now? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can uh, hear you yeah. now, Chris. <laughs> Good. Well, let's hope that's the uh, that's the major faux pas from me of the uh, of the afternoon. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, to this virtual meeting of the Business Manifesto uh, Action Group. Uh, we've all become familiar with the. Uh, virtual Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce events now. Thanks very much for taking the time to, uh, to join us this afternoon for this uh, session on, uh, on compassionate uh, leaders in uh, mental well-being. And we're going to be joined uh, by uh, some very interesting speakers this afternoon, Chris Stewart, Claire Lyons-Collins and uh, Theresa May. So Chris Stewart, very briefly, he's the MD of uh, Minding Minds, which is a, a mental health first aid training organization. And then Claire Lyons-Collins, who many of you will have uh, heard and seen at previous uh, events, who uh, has vast experience in the NHS in, uh, in mental, uh, mental health and was uh, the leader in the development of the National Improvement Model for Mental Health for NHS England. And then uh, last but not least, uh, the Right Honourable Theresa May MP, who will need no more introduction from, uh, fr from me. Um, before I hand over back to, uh, to David Saab, I just wanted to uh, make one sort of personal, personal comment. I don't know if any of you have uh, watched this uh, BBC documentary uh, that's been going on for a few weeks now, a fly on the wall documentary called Ambulance, where we join ambulance crews uh, going around various urban areas, uh, Liverpool originally, I think, are now, are now in London. And if anybody saw the, uh, the programme uh, two nights ago, it was basically about, uh, about dealing with uh, mental health issues where people in, uh, in trouble uh, or troubled people call the, uh, the ambulance, ambulance service for help. And I, I thought it was uh, amazing and really quite inspiring about what's, uh, what the ambulance crews do to people in uh, terrible straits sometimes. There were a couple of interesting captions at the end of the programme. One was this, it said, one in four people will experience a mental health problem each year in England, one in four people in England. And it also said that the ambulance crews in London are now spending 45% of their time dealing with mental health patients. It's uh, up from about 5% five years ago. So a massive increase in the amount of time that the primary care uh, services are spending dealing with uh, with mental health, which I think speaks for its uh, speaks for itself. So, uh, with that, I'm going to hand back to uh, to David. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Okay. There we go. Nod if you can see that. Excellent. Uh, so by way of introduction, I'm David Saab. Most of you will know me, uh, hopefully all of you actually. I'm the Mental Wellbeing Champion and Business Alliance Manager here at the Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce. 
I'm going to share with you something. See these adorable children. Um, well, tonight I'll be visiting my mum as I do on a Thursday night. And uh, this is her favourite picture of the twins. Um, yes, I have a twin sister called Kathy. And uh, that's me on the left, by the way. And uh, Kathy and I were are still inseparable. Uh, we love each other. We have an instinctive connection. We've been very close all of our lives. Um, and we, we, we grew up. That's me before lockdown. Uh, as, a, <laughs> as a teenager, we have always been very close. And, you know, there's me showing that once upon a time, I, I was a bit of a looker. So several years ago, um, Kathy visited me. She lives in New York. And, uh, you know, with, it, with a really close relationship, you can imagine that it's fantastic when your sister comes to visit you. And we went out and we went to Sainsbury's to do some shopping. And after Sainsbury's, she said to me, you know, did you hear those? Did you hear what people were saying about us? I said, what do you mean? And said, did you hear they were being very critical? And to cut a long story short, um, my sister developed schizophrenia and she heard voices. And um, over, over the years, she, she settled on medication and managed to raise a family and everything. But it was quite disruptive to our relationship, as you can imagine. Um, she, she thought for a while that I was being critical of her. And I, I you know, it was, it was quite challenging. That, that's a story of mental health, right? Um, me and my sister, it's quite easy for me to tell you this. What is not so easy for me to say is that I myself struggle with depression and anxiety. It's something that I've struggled with for many years and been through many, many uh, kinds of treatment and therapy, et cetera. Um, but reflecting on this event today, I think it's, it's valuable for me to share with each of you because this is part of what we're dealing with. It's our, our resistance to, you know, whether you call it stigma or shame. Um, I can remember once I was, I was managing, the, um, managing, managing a business for, this, for, for a Dutch importer. And one of my staff came to me and, and was in floods of tears. Um, she, she just couldn't handle things. And uh, so I was, you know, fairly understanding and gave her some time and, you know, she got through it fine. But I can remember distinctly, you know, after, after speaking with her, some of the thoughts that came to my mind were, how are we going to reach target now? How am I, you know, and this is, this is the conflict that we have, isn't it? We've got the bottom line, people still have businesses to run, people are, you know, have to look at the bottom line, but people are also passionate about mental well-being, hence why we've got 140 people here with us today. Um, and it's been my privilege to get to know some of you, and there are even more which are, which are coming into our, into our circle of influence as we walk this journey together. So where are we with the chamber? Well, I'll be the first to admit, and I hope Paul doesn't mind me saying that, that, we're, that we as a chamber are on this journey too. Um, we're, we're still at the beginning of our journey, finding out how we can implement, you know, a mental wellbeing strategy in our organisation. And along with you, we hope to walk this journey together as we learn together what works and what doesn't work. And that's why we've come to this point where we're, about to launch our mental wellbeing charter, something very dear to me that I'm passionate about, um, something which I started writing. And then fortunately uh, with Anna and Claire to help um, make it into something that can be read and, and, and absorbed. Um, we're delighted to be able to present that to uh, Lady May today. Um, so all, all of you listening in the audience, we welcome you to come along with us. Please enjoy this webinar. We welcome your feedback afterwards. And if you would like to be involved with the chamber and with our mental wellbeing community, please do 
let us know. We would love to have you along as we learn together um, how, how best to actually do something, not just talk about it, but how do we really roll out mental wellbeing strategies in our organizations? How do we reach the one who is struggling? So, uh, lastly, a special thanks to um, Karen, my HR, who's as crazy as me, and, and for Gavin, my boss, who instinctively knows when I'm having a rough day, and to Paul, who has, who has the vision to really drive things from the top and lead by example. I'm, I'm really privileged to be a member, to be, a, um, to be part of the Chamber of Commerce. Without further ado, I'm going to hand you back to Chris, who will then introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Chris. David, thank you. Right, so let's uh, let, let's get down to uh, the substance. So we're going to hand over now to uh, Chris Chris Stewart, uh, who I mentioned earlier as the MD of uh, Minding Minds. So uh, Chris is going to talk to us about why compassion why compassionate leadership matters. Over to you, Chris. Thanks very much, Chris. Chris to Chris, excellent. <laughs> Lovely to be here. Thank you. Um, um, great to be here. God, I know I'm in the right place where I get that level of honesty and vulnerability at the beginning. Thank you, David, for, for um, setting the tone for us, because if we don't have that stuff, if we, if, we don't, if we don't risk to be real ourselves, it's very difficult for us to have people around us who, who are going to be real. Um, very quickly, who am I and why am I here? Chris Stewart, Managing Director of Mining Minds. Um, what, what qualifies me to be here? I've spent 15 years working in the substance misuse sector, um, a great deal of which I've spent working with dual diagnosis clients, so people who suffered with substance misuse and mental health problems combined, very common, whether it's people who had mental health problems and then drank or used to make themselves feel better, or people who used a lot um, and ended up um, not being, being well themselves. Um, uh, I've worked in the UK, the Caribbean. I worked in Barbados setting up a rehab over there. And then I came back and formed Minding Minds because I absolutely know that the corporate um, world um, needs to change the way it views mental health. So that's why I'm here. Um, so if I can move on, David, please. Just waiting for the for the next slide to come along. So forgive me for being basic. I'm just trying to keep this as, as simple as possible and give, um, give you my thoughts on what I believe are the two kind of core principles of compassionate leadership. I thought we use these phrases and I think we lose touch with what the words actually mean. So looking at this, you know, what is compassionate? It's a strong desire to alleviate suffering, people who are suffer stricken by misfortune to our ability to feel or show empathy and understanding for those people. Leadership, yeah, really basic, eh? But the action of leading a group of people or an organisation is leadership, but the important bit is leading. And that's to cause somebody to go forward with you. So this is really important that what we're, what we're trying to do is feel or show empathy and understanding we want to alleviate the suffering of people and we are driving that forward, yeah, with our leadership. Next, please, David. So I believe there's two core principles to compassionate leadership. One is an absolute refusal to judge a person or a situation. Why? Because if we walk in and we go, that person is bad, this situation is bad, we have immediately looked at it and believe that we know what is right and wrong. So if we, if we refuse to judge, we'll then apply this insistence to learn from whatever that situation may be, however difficult. And in fact, it's especially when it's faced, we're faced with the most challenging situations or people. So the ones where we would normally walk in and go, this is wrong, uh, it shouldn't be happening, uh, that person's bad, we are losing the ability to, to learn from, from what's in front of us. Um, 
and and I want to give you a, a, a real life situation. I was I was um, training a large national hospitality chain, eighty plus restaurants, or they did then. Um, and one of the guys on the course was their financial loss officer, and and he looked very dismayed after we'd just done the session, the most difficult session, I guess, on on uh, risk of suicide um, and how to manage that and best mitigate it. And and I was talking to him in the break, and he said. He said, I'm really concerned. He said, I've just just investigated a guy who'd stolen a thousand pounds over three months in one of our restaurants. And when he came in front of me, he immediately broke down and said, it was me. I did it. Um, I've got a problem with booze. I was stealing to fund my alcohol habit. I drink because I've got chronic anxiety and depression and I've been self-medicating with it for years. He said, my life is falling apart. My wife has kicked me out. I'm now living in a shared room. I'm about to lose my job and you guys are going to prosecute me, aren't you? And, and I need to make this clear as well. Compassionate leadership doesn't mean to say that we, we run around going there, there and stop doing what is right. If somebody steals from your company and there is a company policy to prosecute, that must be followed through. People need consequences to get well. But what he didn't like was the fact that he had to maintain this very uh, stern, distance, composed, um, authoritarian figure in front of this guy when, the, when this guy was breaking down in front of him. And I said, how did it make you feel apart from anything else? He said, I felt awful, you know? Um, and I said, well, what did the company, what did you and the company learn from this situation? And he said, well, we're going to put more CCTV cameras on tills. And I said, and, and that was it. I said, so, so have you looked at the fact that your hospitality and that alcohol abuse is a really big issue within hospitality? Have you recognized that 10% of the adult population in this country have an unhealthy um, uh relationship with booze did you look at why the line manager hadn't got the training to be able to pick up and spot these signs earlier um it, are you telling all of your staff that they have eap e service you know the employee assistance program services to be able to get help you know the pickup on those services is pathetically low <coughs> excuse me you know so there were you know, do you discuss mental health in every one-to-one -one situa situation you have with a line manager? All of these questions were, were, were like, well, well, no. And then one of the most difficult ones that, are, that compassionate leadership would demand that we look at is then about what is the corporate, what is the corporate relationship with alcohol? Are conventions and, and meetings outside of work always based around alcohol-related um, events you know that i always hear after the corporate dues don't we we have 15 people who made a complete nightmare of themselves and aren't they awful and whatever well i think businesses need to look at so there's some very difficult questions that we can look at and learn from because rather than saying we need to increase our till um uh, uh safety we're actually saying, okay, we're not judging this guy. This, what, what we're saying is, is this guy is ill, not bad, that he has all of these issues. If he has these issues, there's a good chance that lots of our other people will have these issues. Why didn't we pick up? Why aren't we training? And, and the difficulty is, is the, that we look at this and we go, but what about the bottom line? Well, Deloitte's have just refreshed their, their um deep dive on this stuff came out about three weeks ago their median return their median return on investment for mental health training and support is one pound in five pound out so there there aren't many cfos that would look at those figures and go okay maybe we we you know we shouldn't do this i mean it's it's a ridiculously good return on investment so the bottom line says that you know, and I know that this stuff is true. I, I worked with um, Yo Sushi for over a year. At the end of it, we crunched the figures. Their absenteeism was down by 25% and their salaried staff churn was down by nine. And whatever investment they put into us had been reaped back sixfold. 
but there's a really important bit in all of this you know it it's this stuff is the smart thing to do it, it's the smart thing to really look at what any situation can bring us and and strive to make that better but you know what it's also the right thing to do because i know that if that financial loss officer had been able to sit in front of that guy and say here are, here are your local treatment services. Here's the local AA numbers, yeah? This is the number for the Samaritans. You can call them at any point. And to get really brave and say somebody that you are getting rid of for gross misconduct, get really brave and turn around and say, do you know what, even though we're firing you for this and we're prosecuting for you, we're going to extend your EAP service for two months for when you leave. And he would have felt the financial loss officer would have felt better because he'd done the right thing. We'd have mitigated um, a potential bad piece of PR that the guy takes his own life and it becomes a news story. But it is just doing the right thing. And it's accepting that he's going to go away from that situation, even though he's been fired, thinking that you're a good company. And to follow up on David's stuff, I know this stuff to be absolutely true. Because in 1994, I was sat in front of the man that owned the business that I worked in. And he was saying, Chris, I have to fire you for the money that you stole. And I have to prosecute you because that is the way that we do this. But I am not judging you. I don't think you're bad. I think you're ill. And I just want you to get better. So the guy that's in front of you today ended up as a street homeless, dual diagnosis um, client, yeah, who, who uh, somewhere along the line got well and was able to go and work with dual diagnosis street homeless clients, go and sit on the, the red sofa on BBC Breakfast talking about this stuff and is able to be sat in front of you today. We can't judge because it's, it's missing the opportunity to learn, but we also can't judge because we don't know what the outcome is, you know, and I, I've been back and thanked that guy for his kindness over the, uh, over the, that period. And you know what, I've sent a lot of business his way. And if anybody ever asked me about his business, even though I'd been fired, he would have been um, one of the, uh, the, the greatest bosses I'd ever had. You know, recovery is possible and probable and it does happen. But this refusal to judge and insistence to learn is, is what I'd like you to take away from today. Um, so if we just have the final slide, which is a lovely uh, quote from, from uh, a couple of guys who wrote for the King's Fund. About, it's actually about around the NHS, but it says the only way to respond to the challenges that face us is through radical innovation, transformational change. It demands... For us, it demands that we look at it differently. And the evidence of the research is clear that compassionate leadership is the vital cultural element for innovation in organisations. We have to get brave and look at the different. Thanks. I'll leave it there. Chris, thank you so much. Um, I almost feel we should pause and absorb um, the... Uh, uh, the, the frankly inspirational comments that you've uh, you, you've just made I can see from what's going on on the chat that it's had a profound impact all, already so uh, thank you very much for that unfortunately we don't have time this afternoon just to uh, absorb um, the gravity of what you've been telling us we're going to have to move on but again thank you very much indeed I found that not only interesting but uh, yeah moving thank you uh, let's move on now to uh, Claire Lyons Collins, and she's going to uh, talk about the, uh, uh, the 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 new uh, charter that we're producing at the Chamber of Commerce on mental well-being, and uh, and she's going to introduce uh, Theresa May, who uh, should be joining us uh, well now. So over to you, Claire. Uh, thank you very much, much, Chris. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Claire Lyons Collins, and I am. Um, currently um, supporting the Chamber with uh, the Mental Wellbeing Charter and I've worked with the Chamber now for about a year which has been uh, fantastic and can I just say oh wow you know that story Chris and David I have a lump in my throat and what I love about this it is it is 
happening organically within the chamber. And, and these these webinars that we do is we, we start off with a with a personal story and, and the reason why we are here. And and it's that vulnerability and that ability to um, share our experience and our our hope and recovery. So thank you so much. And fantastic photos, David. I agree you look like uh, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, can I just check if we have Mrs. May on the line? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hopefully you can, some, some of you can see me, so yes. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. May. It's lovely to see you virtually again. Um, uh, we, we met last year um, at uh, the um, at St. George's House at in a, in a similar event. And um, thank you so much for joining us. It, it's wonderful to have you. I, you know, you need no introduction. Um, uh, having been our former prime minister and i said it i said it last year and i'll say it again about the amazing work that you have done to champion uh mental health um so i'll talk a little bit about the charter so we um we have been doing some webinars during the year about mental health and we did one in june and we had different organizations talking about their mental well-being programs and and kind of the elephant in the room was was covid and was the pandemic we're going through and um i remember speaking at the end and and mrs may you challenged the chamber last year about you know picking up this subject um more um and you know supporting and learning from each other within the thames valley and when we wrote the charter, we wanted to make it really current because we're in a very um, ambiguous, ambiguous time and um, anxiety provoking time for many people, for many, for many organizations. And, you know, we wanted to make it, you know, that we have noticed that, and I'm sure everybody has seen that um, our home life and our work, I'm in, I'm in our bedroom, right now and um, our home life and our, and our work life are, are very interchangeable at the moment with so many people working from home. So we looked at the charter and we created it this year with uh, David and Anna from PwC um, and we looked, we wanted to focus on really around, around what's going on right now. And this was something quite different. We've all, I don't know if, if, if we could say that COVID is a gift, but it's almost springboarded organisations into looking at this issue into more depth. So um, we have asked different organisations to um, pledge to, to the Charter um, within the Thames Valley. And, and we're very proud of the work and we, and we hope that it will, you know, it will inspire. I think, we, David, we've got six sessions next year planned um, and one session for the end of this year. And our hope really is, um, as people have attested to, we're on a journey um, and there is a, a, a large wealth of, of knowledge um, within businesses within the chamber and an increased, if I can say, an increased willingness um, to, share, to share good practice. And we hope that the charter um, reaches those who are you know big big organisations as well as um, small to medium enterprises because we wouldn't want anyone to be left out, but it, you know the the difficulty difficulty with these things is always the easy bit is the charter, the more challenging bit is the how, um, but I think as a group of as a group of people and a group of organisations and a group of organisations um, under the the direction and steer of the chamber. Um, we hope to learn more from each other and to help help each other and help organisations to get through this almost this double whammy we have, which is around the pandemic, but also around the recession. So without further ado, um, I, if I could hand over to you, Mrs May, to deliver the keynote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Claire. And it's a great pleasure to be able to join you all uh, this afternoon. And can I just say, I'm sorry, I, I was only able to join uh, just at the very tail end of what Chris was uh, saying, I was uh, at a meeting with a minister discussing another issue that I think is important to employers, which I might come on to, which is uh, domestic abuse. Um, and that meeting overran. But from the uh, just the very end piece that I caught from what Chris was saying, I recognise how significant uh, his words were uh, in terms of bringing that personal experience to people. 
And I think that is so important. But can I say thank you to Chris? And uh, from the chat, I think David must have also brought um, some experience into the uh, discussion today. It's really important that people like yourselves actually stand up and tell these stories. Um, because for those who haven't had those experiences, it's very difficult to understand simply from reading words on a piece of paper what it is about and actually hearing people being able to articulate um, and through from that experience actually being able to help others to understand and experience and understand what a res good response is is hugely important so thank you for, for being willing to do that today and thank you also to the chamber for carrying on with this agenda which I think is so important. I mean, sometimes um, it's my experience that organizations will highlight on and you know, sort of alert a, a light on an issue and they will then sort of move away from it. They'll perhaps have a few discussions about it and then move away. The fact that you're continuing with this and that you have developed the charter, I think is hugely important. And I think it's particularly important um, at the moment. And uh, Claire referenced that. Referenced that. I think if we look at where we are in terms of the impact of COVID, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, lockdown, the impact of the various restrictions, the changes in rules and so forth from COVID, let alone um, the concerns of people who perhaps have uh, family, and friends uh, who have suffered particularly from COVID, the, th there is a mental health impact from COVID. There's a mental health impact for those who are having to work from home in difficult circumstances, for whom perhaps being able to get out of the house and have that wider experience has been helpful to them. Um, and there's a mental health impact on the anxiety that people will be feeling. We know there'll be business owners, small business owners particularly worried about the future of their businesses. There'll be employees worried about the future of their jobs. Um, and this happens, there's the, obviously, significant government support's been available, but this will still be a concern and anxiety that people will have. And so right now, I think is very, a very important time to be saying to businesses in the Thames Valley that mental health is, is important and that business leaders' leadership can make a real difference to the, the mental health of individuals with whom, uh, who are working for them and the mental health of individuals with whom they're interacting. And uh, that understanding of this issue is the first thing. And then, of course, it's what do you do about it? And I thought it was, I was particularly pleased to see the charter um, giving that expectation to businesses that they recognise the importance of being the sort of employer who, to whom an employee can speak to about their mental health situation and know that they will get a positive response, a sympathetic response, and a response, crucially, that aims to work with them to ensure that they can continue to uh, be doing the job that they want to be doing. I think it's giving that environment is so, so important. And it's very interesting when um, Dennis Stevenson and Paul Farmer produced their report on uh, mental health in the workplace, commissioned as PM, I remember sitting with a group of employees and, and, uh, from a particular business and talking to them. And one of them said that one of the most important things was that they just set up a group drop-in, obviously not so easy these days, because it was a physical drop-in then, um, sort of once a week where people with issues or worried or could, could just drop in and have a chat. And that for a lot of people that had released a stress that they were undergoing individually, but being able to share their experiences was so important. So very often the answers for employees aren't dramatic. Um, very often they're not uh, answers that cost a lot of money, um, but it's actually about, if you like, a personal understanding and a humane response uh, that is important. And it's those at the top of organizations that set the scene within an organization. Um, one thing I would say about that is we've seen in a number of areas that sometimes you can get people at particularly in big or large or businesses, people at the top say this is a terribly important thing, very important for everybody to understand. Um, but somehow at middle management level, it, it doesn't quite get, um, get the support that it needs. And I think that's where real leadership is so important. 
in order to ensure that these issues are ones that are genuinely undertaken and genuinely um, uh, addressed. If I could just come back to the, the situation we're in now in COVID, but also just cast it forward a little. We're going to have to learn to live with this disease. Um, we're not going to eliminate it. It's going to be with us. Uh, so we have to find ways of being able to do that. And that will continue to have an impact. I hope it will have as little impact on people as, as possible as we uh, gradually learn to find our way through this. But as we all know, new ways of working, there's been this sudden revelation during lockdown that everybody, well, not everybody, but an awful lot of people can work from home. Um, and there's all these articles that say the new workplace will be home in future. People will be working from home. I think it, I think what we're going to see is just a bit more flexibility between people working um, off site in some form or working at uh, working at home. But. Even that scenario, attractive though it might seem, is going to bring with it some different mental health uh, impacts and mental health stresses for people. And I think it's important when employers are thinking about their future structures for their businesses and the future physical structure for their business, that they think about the mental health impact that that will have on individuals as well. The importance for some of actually being able to be in an environment where they can socialise, where they can be with others and discussing issues with others, for example, rather than the isolation that can be felt when somebody is simply working from home. And the, the way in which if you're working from home and others are working, in, uh, are working together in an office, you start really to feel left out in, in what you're doing. And that can have an impact on people. So the new ways of working have to be looked at through this lens of, uh, of, of mental health as well. Um, so this isn't just a question to me of thinking about there will be some employees who have mental health issues and how do companies actually respond to that. It's actually how do companies look at holistically at what they're doing, how they're setting the scene for employer, employees, how they're setting their work uh, uh, environments and the impact that that has on people's mental health uh, as well. I mentioned earlier that I've been in a meeting about domestic abuse because I just want to, I'm going to be a little, I know we've been talking particularly about mental health, but I just want to raise this as well because both of these areas fit into what I think is an important issue at the moment, which is what is a good company in the 21st century? What is a good employer, a good business? What are the things, what are the, the responsibilities that a business has beyond simply providing value for shareholders? And I think that these issues around how employees are treated, setting those environments is one of those issues. And it relates to domestic abuse as well. An employer that ensures that within their working environment, somebody who is perhaps subject to domestic abuse is able to, I, uh, have somebody they can speak to and get an understanding of the situation they're going through is very important as well. And this, both in mental health and domestic abuse, has an impact on the bottom line um, because there are many, there'll be many employees up and down the country who will be taking time off work um, because they have a mental health uh, 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 problem, because they, they're at a point of uh, perhaps potential crisis, or because they're subject to domestic uh, uh, domestic abuse. Um, and but don't feel able to admit that and therefore not getting the support they need to be able to help them to deal with this and hopefully um, and obviously the answers will be different but to be able to deal with uh, with this so actually ensuring that your that employees have that ability to be able to talk to people know where they can and, and people in an organization will know where to to point them to for help is incredibly important to the business in terms of the productivity of employees and the bottom line, uh, every bit as much as those other issues. So this isn't something that should be seen, I think, just as um, almost a sort of social justice issue, although in many ways it is. But I think it is also something that if uh, employees actually stop and employers actually stop and think about it, is important for the future of your businesses and the success of your businesses as well. And that's where I think, in overall terms, for the business of the future. It's important to be looking widely at these concepts. We all know, you know, the, the, the uh, initials CSR became ESG and so forth. But actually sitting where a company, thinking about what a company's purpose is, about how it treats its employees, about how it treats its customers. These are important issues 
for the future of companies. And increasingly, I think employees will be, potential employees will be looking at companies and saying, what are you doing in this area, in that area? Somebody might say, I have a mental health issue. Are you as an employer actually going to be able to provide me with the environment? Do you understand this issue? Will you be understanding if I have a problem and come to you with that problem? And so companies that are able to offer this, I think are going to have an advantage in the workplace in terms of the uh, those that they are appealing to. But Claire mentioned the charter, not just the charter, but actually how you then put it into practice. It's one thing putting words on paper. It's one thing getting a commitment for everybody to, uh, to deal with this um, uh, and to uphold the charter. But it's another thing to actually make sure that within an organization, this is genuinely what is being put in place. And I don't know what the chamber has in terms of um, intentions for sort of mon monitoring sounds a very sort of uh, big brother uh, word in this end, but actually just getting an understanding across the chamber of what businesses are doing, how businesses are supporting people, and how businesses are ensuring that the charter is genuinely being put in place. But I think it's important to continue in following up on, on, this, uh, on this area, which as I say, I think is incredibly important. It's something that's been ignored for um, too long. I've seen, while I've been speaking, there's been various little chat messages coming up, people talking about the elephant in the room of talking about mental, mental health and mental illness. It's very important that this isn't an elephant in the room, that we recognize that this is something that we um, need to address, that this isn't something to shy away from or be frightened of. I think often people think that they need to sort of worry about somebody who has mental illness or mental health problem. No, this is somebody who, they might have broken their arm and you'd have been, you know, you'd have asked them how they were if they'd broken their arm. With a mental health problem, they have a health problem, it's just not physical, it's mental. So let's just get over the idea that this is somehow something completely different. This is uh, an issue to be addressed, to be recognized, for employers to deal with considerately and uh, carefully and compassionately. And as, uh, as I'm sure, as I saw that you'd heard, how an employer reacts can make a huge difference, not just to their business, but to the future life of that individual. And that is something that everybody should be thinking about as well. So well done to the chamber, well done for putting the charter together. I hope you are going to see organizations signing willingly up to this charter and putting it into practice and ensuring that they are good places for their employees, good places for employees who have uh, mental health problems, mental illness to, to work in, and uh, places which as a result will be doing good, well for their business, well for their local society, and actually showing leadership, not just in the business, but more widely too. So thank you, and thank you to all those in the chamber who will be putting this into practice and showing real leadership. Theresa, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for, for joining us. And uh, if I may say so, thank you for keeping this on the, uh, in the public eye, on the policy agenda at a time when there are so many other things going on. We, you mentioned the, uh, the, the, the C word, there's also the B word out there as well. So thanks for keeping this, uh, this out, out there and uh, talking to ministers uh, about this and using your, uh, your influence to make sure that it, uh, it's, not, it's not overlooked. A um, couple of things stood out for me from what you were just saying, when to, and I was putting it through my own mind for my own time in, in, uh, in large organizations. And that is of course, very true in your constituency and across the Thames Valley, very much based on the service sector and knowledge-based people, cognitive employees, by far and away the most important asset that businesses have are their people. So it's astonishing, isn't it, really, that traditionally over the years, employers have paid relatively little attention to the well-being of their employees versus perhaps the well-being of their, uh, of their businesses or their, their machinery or their company cars or whatever. So it's a useful reminder to us that the most important thing we have 
our as our people and the the store of uh, of experience and know-how that they have and as you then expanded on the sheer cost of uh, of what happens when uh, people uh, people go wrong when people are unable to uh, perform their their jobs to their the best of their ability everybody loses out the individual employee loses out and of course the business suffers uh, suffers enormously and the point about let's treat um, mental health problems in the same way we would if someone came into the office with a broken limb when we'd all be queuing up to sign the uh, the uh, the, 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 the plaster cast <laughs> uh, rather than shirking away from it as perhaps uh, we have hitherto with the whole traditional stigma around around mental health. So thank you again very much for, for joining us. I, th I know we've got one or two questions lined up. There's a, a Q&A uh, coming up and I'm just wondering if uh, if Sarah at the Chamber is going to uh, curate, this for, curate this for us or whether uh, Sarah you'd like me to, uh, to put a couple of questions to Mrs May. Absolutely, Chris, thank you. If you can see the question, by all means, please do. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start off with a couple of, uh, couple of questions we had in before, before uh, today. And uh, first one's from actually from, from, from Claire, Claire Lyons-Collins, who has a, a question, uh, Teresa, about uh, the extent to which uh, uh, the pandemic and the, and the lockdown in, uh, in your constituency has had an effect upon the, the sort of community spirit in the uh, in the um, in the constituency, we know it's been a stress for people. But have you seen any any upside in terms of community spirit or connectedness with pe with people between people that perhaps offset some of the potential uh, mental downsides of the lockdown? Well, yes. I mean, it's a good issue to raise, Claire, and uh, certainly I was very pleased to see across the constituency a lot of people in the community actually coming together and providing support for others, be that people um, you know, making sure that just an individual neighbour who was perhaps shielding had their, they went out and got food for them, through to um, a, one of our schools printing, uh, using their 3D printer to um, print masks uh, for the visors for uh, PPE. Um, yeah. So a whole range of activities that took place, pe people really came together um, at that time. And I think, and now, one of the things that we see is actually, certainly I know both local authorities in the constituency, looking to see how they can try and maintain some of that community activity into the uh, into the future, so that it wasn't just based around the pandemic, as we know, as I say, we're going to have to learn to live with this, so there may be those for whom uh, they will continue to want to be very careful about their interactions, and having that voluntary support in the community will be important. So I think it's true to say I'm fortunate in my constituency that a lot of people get involved in a lot of voluntary and charitable activities in the mm. constituency, um, but that sort of went up a notch, uh, 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 certainly for lockdown, uh, mm. and uh, in terms of people's willingness to put themselves out to try and provide that support to support to others. But I know, for example, um, in my own local church, and, and uh, my husband and I were on a list of people ringing some people. We had a whole group of people ringing those who were elderly people who were perhaps on their own or people with health conditions that meant that they were shielding. Um, and uh, the church wants to carry that on, wants to continue the, uh, uh, that process because it, it shouldn't just, something like that shouldn't just be for the pandemic. It shouldn't just be for lockdown. It should be for us all in terms of um, you know, being part of our local community. So if, if I may, Chris, if, if that's okay, just, just to comment slightly on that very quickly. Um, so eggs, eggs were a very valuable commodity on our streets WhatsApp group. And I know in um, eggs and flour, does anyone have eggs? Does anyone have flour? And, and actually the WhatsApp group has, is, has probably got about 75 members. I live in, in London and, and we have continued with, you know, I'm popping up to Tesco's, does anybody need anything? And it really has brought lots of people together. So I thought it was important to ask you um, about that. And, and if, if I may, there's, a, there's some great examples up in Newcastle that the Mental Health Trust up there, we've got Dr. Carl Kaplan here um, about what they have been doing with, the, you know, to help with that connectedness and, and keeping people connected. So I don't know if there's time for Carol to comment, Chris. <laughs> Carol, would you like to, before we move on for, to another question, Dr. Carol Kaplan, do you have a, 
I would, I, would, I would just say that uh, I would echo everything that uh, Mrs. May has said. Um, the, the issue of connectedness is both with your work colleagues and with your community. And if you could cross the divide, that's something that makes a very big difference. We've done that um, in the trust that I work in, which is a mental health trust, where there's been a very careful program of supporting our staff. And the first thing we did having created it was open it to all the partners in the area so that everybody has access and they're connected in the way that they look after their community. And I certainly hope that it can last into the future. I won't go on in any great detail. Right, thank you very much for that. Let's move on. Uh, I think we've got lots of questions stacking up. I'm not sure we'll be able to get to all of them. Uh, we'll see whether we can follow up with in some way. But the next question, I know Carl Simmons has sent in a written question, um, but yeah, I think he's on the line and would like to ask it uh, personally. So. Carl, if you're there, over to you, please. I am. Thanks, Chris. Hello, Mrs. May. Um, good to speak to yeah. you and see you. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I love how passionate. Yes, you he's are. getting both. I love how passionate you are. In a minute. Subject. Oh. Um. So uh, there's a bit of disruption here on the line. Um. But it's more important than ever now that businesses don't create an environment which leads to their people becoming unharmed, uh, becoming harmed as a result of it. Um, but I'm interested in how the government's going to hold companies to account um, when there's no requirement for those businesses to report where they create, where they make somebody go off unwell through stress, anxiety, depression. The reality is for injuries, they still have this requirement to report. And we have a regulator that then investigates and looks into what that business is doing to prevent a recurrence. But we have no requirement for it to do that where businesses lead to somebody being harmed or going off work unwell. So what can the government do about this? Why isn't it notifiable under the regulations? Well, Carl, I, I think I, I knew you were going to be raising this issue, which you <laughs> raised with me last year when I, I spoke at the, uh, at the dinner. And as you know, that the, the government's response at that stage, I suspect would be the same today, is that it's much, hard, effectively, it's much harder to identify um, the, in relation to stress and mental health issues and to identify whether that has been the result of something that's happened at work. So if somebody has an accident at work, obviously health and safety executive have, uh, there's a role there in terms of uh, reporting. Um, but that, that uh, it's harder to, uh, as I say, identify whether if somebody's mental health issue has been exacerbated or triggered by something that's happened at work. And obviously Stevenson Pharma in their report didn't raise the possibility of, of legislating to change this, to require uh, a reporting. But I mean, the, the fundamental question to ask about how does government actually identify what's happening if it doesn't know is a very good one. Um, and uh, I think, uh, I suspect we, would, we won't see a change on this particular aspect in terms of the reporting requirement from government. But I think what we may be able to see is because of the extra um, support and, and uh, uh, emphasis that's been given on mental health is just to try to, to, to bring government round in a sense to recognising that there's an issue here as, uh, as well that might in due course lead to some way of ensuring that there is, uh, that there is some um, identification of what is happening in the workplace and the impact that, uh, that the workplace can have on people. So, sorry, that's a bit of a rambling response, which says, I don't think anything's going to change immediately, but I think it's just a question of, of um, putting the issue again. And so I'll raise it, I'll raise it again with, uh, with government. I may get the same answer, but I'll try and find a way to um, yeah. encourage them to look at it from a slightly different a... angle. I'd be delighted to help. And oh. what food for thought is, in 95, when we were looking at red, no, he hasn't come home yet. We had the same conversation Just around wait. musculoskeletal oh, injuries. Well, 20 past, he comes out. So he's if somebody, because everybody mute, please. Um, we had the same conversation around back injuries. Was it caused yeah. or was it not? And we ended up putting it in, you know, so it can be overcome. And I think it's, there's ways to have that conversation. But anyway, um, thank you very much for your response, as always, Mrs. May, taking it seriously. Carl, thank you very much for that one. So um, moving on, uh, Anna, Anna Blackman, who I think is on the line from PwC. Anna, I believe you have a question for uh, Theresa May. I do. Thank you, Chris. 
uh, lovely to meet you, Mrs May, we've not met before. Um, and thank you for coming to talk to the Chamber today. I think it's been really valuable to hear your thoughts. I guess the question I wanted to ask was, we've had parity of esteem as a kind of concept for some time in terms of funding for mental health being you know, treated equivalently to, to physical health. And I, I guess I was wondering what you think the key barrier is to moving that on and, and actually whether you think the pandemic is going to make that harder or perhaps we think it might make it easier. I'd just be interested to get your perspective on that. I think the um, obviously there has been some movement. There has been more money going into uh, into mental health provision within the health service. There's work to uh, recruit more staff, mental health professionals, more mental health care, uh, healthcare staff. Um, but the, the gap has been very significant, as you know, over the years. And so it's going to take some time to uh, get to a position where people can feel that there really is a, a parity of esteem between mental and physical health. I think the second part of your question is an interesting one. And I think it can be, I think it could go either way um, in terms of the impact of the pandemic. Of course, right now, the emphasis is all on the uh, treatment of the disease it coming uh, uh, as we're looking into the future. It's already starting, but looking into the future, there's going to be a huge emphasis on catching up from those um, treatments and operations that have not been taking place because of the impact of the pandemic in the early months. And so the, the health service, I think, will be focusing very much on those issues. Where mm -hmm. I think, it, but what I think is important is to raise with them this issue about that there haven't only been those physical health aspects, there have been mental health aspects as well. So, you know, there will be people who haven't been able to access their mental health um, therapies as a result of the emphasis that's been given on pandemic, or people who've been um, worried about going to the place where they would normally access that therapy because of the issues around, around COVID. Um, so I think getting across to the health service that they need to think about that aspect as well, alongside what I was talking about earlier, that the, the lockdown itself could be generating more mental health problems and more mental health issues for people. Uh, so I, I suspect for some time, we will see a real emphasis on the physical side, physical health side, simply because there's such a backlog in that area has so obviously been building up and the health service, we, we, we will all want to be, uh, to be dealing with uh, that. Um, so, but I think it's up to all of us to make sure, and, and those of us in the political work realm, particularly perhaps to make sure that ministers are aware and those in the health service are aware that there's a mental health, there are mental health issues here as well. And they mustn't forget those. They've got to put a focus on, on those at the same time. Thank you. Right, thank you. Um, so um, next question from Stuart Carroll at Sanofi. Stuart, I believe you have a, question for uh, for mrs may yes thank you thank you very much chris and uh, hello teresa um Hi. very good to hear your words i know having worked very closely with you locally in my role as a councillor this is an issue you take very very seriously um so two parts of the question really we, we've talked about what defines a good employer um the economic imperative of staff and also uh, the elephant in the room uh, Carl asked a specific question around the legal framework, but what more do you think government could be doing or should be doing to support, incentivize organisations to embed mental health and compassionate leadership, whether that be financially or socially or with incentives? And the second bit, you talked about domestic abuse and obviously just come from a meeting. And this is an issue we've worked together on locally with the Dash charity. You do a, you know, an amazing job. Again, how, what do you think government should be doing to assist employers to ensure that their role within identifying domestic abuse and spotting the signs can also be enhanced? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. And uh, thank you for everything that you're doing locally in relation to these, uh, these issues, particularly the mental health issue. Um, if I may, the domestic abuse question you've asked is slightly easier to answer than the mental health uh, question. And the reason for that is that the Department for Business, um, Energy and Industrial Strategy has already launched a consultation with employers about 
um, domestic abuse about how what work employers should be doing to ensure that they're providing the environment in which those of their employees who are the victims of domestic abuse can be um, provided with the support that they, that they need. Um, they will be looking, I'm sure, at um, various issues. There are some companies that will, for example, if somebody is um, uh, subject to domestic abuse and is leaving their home, uh, who I think it's the bank actually provide uh, during lockdown, were providing hotel accommodation for an employee who had to leave their home because of domestic abuse. Um, so but the, the Bayes is looking at the, what, it, what employers should be doing and is, uh, I think the consultation closes fairly soon and then they'll be producing a report and a set of proposals. Um, employers can also on the domestic abuse front join the Employers Initiative on Domestic Abuse run by Dame Elizabeth Filkin, um, which gives support to employers, um, takes good practice from different businesses, um, shares that with others uh, and uh, ensures that as far as possible employers are given the information they need to be able to, to help with this. Um, there isn't an equivalent, uh, as far as I'm aware, on the mental health side, um, but I think I would say that it, is, it isn't just about what government can do on the mental health side. I, I'm not sure there are areas of funding that this would be, um, would, would fit into. I think the key thing for government is raising awareness of this is an issue and awareness of how important it is for employers. Maybe, and I hadn't thought of this before, but maybe we should actually, um, I should actually suggest to government that they need in perhaps a year's time to look at the Stevenson Farmer review, to look at how employers have taken that on, what evidence there is there that it has been followed through, uh, and to see what more they need, would, might need to do to ensure that those proposals were, were followed through, because in a sense, we've got a framework um, for employers. It's a question of ensuring that that's put into practice. Okay, next question uh, from the, uh, the Q&A stream that we now have. Uh, and for this one, it seems uh, you've been promoted, Teresa, because it says Lady May, do you feel that senior leaders opening up about their mental health challenges can have a positive effect on creating a culture where people feel more open? And do you feel that leaders in government can do more, more here? Now, this is not very traditional of our politics, is it? What, what do you think? Yes, well, um, technically the, the uh, form of address is correct. Uh, <laughs> because my husband, my husband was knighted. Uh, in the he summer. was, wasn't he? Yes, Technically that is correct, <laughs> although I'm not using it. So, um, but, um, my I apologies. Think, no, don't worry, not at all. I think the, the, it is incredibly important actually for senior leaders to, to show, to be able to share their experiences and show that to, to people. There was, um, and the, the debate about mental health in the health, House of Commons was helped enormously when one of my parliamentary colleagues, Charles Walker, actually stood up in the House of Commons and admitted that he had mental health issues. Mm. And then a number of others uh, came forward with that. Uh, it took a lot. As I was saying earlier, it takes a lot, given the stigma around mental health, for somebody to do that. But it's hugely important because then others can feel that, that in a sense, they're not, they're not alone. Um, and that there are people up there doing these sorts of jobs who, who suffer you know, and have mental health issues as well or, or suffer from mental illness. So I think it, it is very important that um, people in leadership positions who have these experiences do speak about them and uh, and um, ensure and you know I think one of the problems today is that in today's media world if a senior businessman was to say something like this or businesswoman was to say something like this then the danger is the media you know sort of latch onto it and create you know, mm. they could create a positive story around it but more often than not it might be a negative story around it and that often tends to put people people off but I would hope that we would see people being willing to come forward where they have had issues of this sort. I think the, um, I mean, we've seen huge leadership in this area from Prince William and Prince Harry talking yeah. about these issues, being willing to come forward and, and, and talk about it. Um, we, you know, actors, Stephen Fry, uh, and, you know, others talking about it, sports people talking about it. I think these are all important because they all help to generate an environment in which this is no longer something odd, this is no longer something you don't talk about or that very few people have. It's recognised this is something that affects a huge number of people. 
uh, and should be dealt with, as we were saying earlier, just as um, a broken arm or, or a, a physical pro health problem would be. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think uh, it's becoming more orthodox uh, in uh, leadership training uh, uh, organizations now to, uh, to ensure that leaders understand that displaying one's vulnerability and humanity are a really important part of leadership and uh, should, shouldn't be overlooked at all. Um, another question uh, from a lady called Helen Pote. Uh, she says, Dear Teresa, I manage 100 young trainee clinical psychologists who are working in the NHS and studying at, uh, at the Royal Holloway University. 90% are women, all incredibly bright, driven by their caring values, but sometimes uncertain of their authority. They will be the next generation of NHS mental health leaders. What advice would you offer them about becoming compassionate uh, female leaders? Gosh, that is, um, that is quite a question um, yes. because it hits at some of the issues that female leaders come across. Normally, um, the question is the other way around. It's about how can female leaders show, show um, uh, sort of, uh, authority without appearing to be without being classed as aggressive and, and uh, so forth. Um, all too often, uh, I think there is a, um, a sense, though on the other side of the equation, if you like, that if a female in a leadership position shows a sort of softer side, that that is a weakness rather than a positive. Mm. Um, and so uh, my, advice to, my advice to them is don't shy away from showing that compassionate side because it's an important part of the job that you're going to be doing. And actually the more people who do it, the more normal it becomes and the less people feel that it's something that is setting a woman aside as something different and, and somehow a weakness there. Um, but of course, there's, as we all know, in all of these areas of responsibility, it's uh, everybody will be managing in leadership roles, managing that ability to make tough decisions together with that recognition of when it's important to, uh, to be, um, to show that compassion and, and uh, show that, um, I was going to say softer side, but I'm not sure, so is that then sort of takes it down that sort of um, area where we've all been uh, told, if you like, or, or brought up to believe that that soft side isn't something that you show in a leadership role, but of course it is, and as we've been, as you've been hearing, that compassionate side in leadership can make all the difference. And actually a good leader is a leader who has the judgment to know when to exercise compassion and when it's necessary to be tough. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, we've got one last question uh, on the, uh, the system, which is uh, from a lady called Judy Clawton, who I assume is involved in, uh, in a, an, an SME business rather than a large corporate. And she asks this. What can we do to support the increasing divide that is happening as a result of some of these positive initiatives? I'm seeing some wonderful initiatives offered to corporate employees that are just not available or affordable for smaller businesses. Mm. Very good question, Judy. I'm not sure I've got an immediate answer to it other than that actually, I think for smaller businesses, this is where organizations like the Chamber can perhaps be particularly helpful. Um, in ensuring that, the, that there is support at a more local level for small businesses. You're right, a lot of these things that we talk about, it's easier for a large business to take them on board. They've got HR departments, they've got the people, they can um, you know, in, ensure that they're providing the training and so forth. Doesn't mean to say they all do it well, of course, because I think one of the dangers for the big organisations is it becomes a tick box. Um, oh yes, we'll give somebody the title of, you know, mental health or, or uh, something else, and then we've solved the problem, which of course we all know isn't, isn't the case. Right. But I think my, my um, response to you would be that I think this is why, for smaller businesses, it's why it's so important that organisations like the Chambers are look, like the Chamber are looking at these issues, perhaps able to provide that support at a local level, which um, doesn't come naturally because of, just because of the size of the business. Yep, I, I think I must be right. Thank you, thank you for that. Well, I think we've uh, we've run out of questions from the uh, from the system now. So unless anyone uh, has a an urgent question, then speak now, please, or forever hold your peace. 
And in the absence of a, an immediate intervener on that, I am going to, uh, to hand over to Adam Marshall, the Director General of British Chambers of Commerce, who, uh, who has joined us this afternoon. And I think he'd like to offer up a, a vote of thanks to Theresa May for joining us this afternoon. So Adam, over to you. Thank you, Chris, very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, for me, this has been a really inspiring and thought provoking afternoon on so many levels. And it's my privilege now to get to do something which is important for mental health, whether you're in business, working in a charity, in the public sector, or any other organization, which is to say thank you. It's a powerful set of words for all of us and for our mental health. Um, first, I want to thank Thames Valley Chamber for its leadership in the Chamber Network on this issue. Second, to say thank you to all of those who have shared your personal stories with us today. I think you affect and you influence the rest of us more than you can possibly know by sharing. And the chat and the discussion has been a testament to that. And then of course, on behalf of Thames Valley Chamber members and the network of British Chambers, both here in the UK and right across the world, I wanna say thank you to a long standing friend of our business communities, the Right Honourable Theresa May MP. Um, I had the privilege, everyone, of working with Mrs. May during her many years of service on the front benches and, of course, during her time as Prime Minister. One thing that always struck me during those incredibly intense years of negotiation, uh, of political tension, of 24-hour-a-day difficulty, uh, was how hard it must have been to face both constant work stress and to combine that with unfortunate personal attacks incivility on the part of so many, and of course, relentless opposition, whilst maintaining one's own mental well-being and resilience. Now, Minster, but I can say, frankly and honest, seeing it from the edges, that it can take an emotional and personal toll on both individuals and of course on families. And um, which is why it's so important that Mrs. May has done what she has to highlight this issue, both during her time in high office and since. Uh, and she really deserves a vote of thanks from all of us for her determination to ensure that mental health issues are not in the shadows uh, and are both properly looked after and properly funded by government as well. Uh, I think, Mrs. May, your work has taken on an added importance to us all during the pandemic, as you said during your comments earlier, when all of us have faced challenges to our resilience and to our well-being as well. Um, those of us who are lucky enough to be in leadership roles uh, have worked even harder at that bond of trust between employer and employee. But I think if I were to say something optimistic, it would be that in so many of our businesses, that bond of trust has actually grown a lot over the last eight months because of the conversations that people are having with each other about mental health and about personal well-being in business. You referred to what makes a good company in the 21st century. Uh, and I think many of us will completely agree with you today. A good company is one whose leaders are human, uh, who genuinely build up that sense of trust, compassion, and well-being in their firms and whatever the size or sector they may be acting in, and who are upfront about mental health issues from the top down. Uh, as you said, two chambers can lead the way and can help. And I want to thank the entire Thames Valley Chamber team for doing precisely that with this webinar series, with the charter, and so much more besides. Uh, but most of all, Thanks to you, Mrs. May, we've learned a huge amount from you today and from colleagues over the course of the questioning. Uh, and I know we will be pleased to work together with you on this issue as we move into an uncertain time ahead, but also into hopefully a better future. Chris, I can I hand back to you? Adam, thank you very much. And thank you very much for those kind words and for taking the time to, uh, to join us uh, this, uh, this afternoon. And uh, just to remind those of us who are not aware, um, Adam, of course, is going to be moving on shortly from the, from the BCC. So again, we'd like to wish you all, all the best in bon, bon voyage. Um, right, so at this point, I think, uh, uh, Teresa, we're going to say goodbye to you as you have uh, other things to do. Once again, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And we hope to see you again, either as it were in the flesh at a chamber event or or uh, remotely. Let's hope uh, it's a situation in which we can all meet together at Windsor Castle or, or somewhere uh, 
equally convivial rather than over uh, over the technology in the not too distant future. So thank you. I echo that, Chris. <laughs> thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Right. Well, we're we're going to uh, we're going to start the wrap up now. And uh, what I'm going to do now is ask uh, Adrian McMahon from the uh, from the chamber to give us an update on what's been going on or what's planned with the uh, the Business Alliance. So, uh, Adrian, are you there, please? Yes, indeed. Uh, good afternoon, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, firstly, uh, just to say thank you to the speakers today. Absolutely amazing. And uh, I'm sure my comments and sentiments are being echoed by everybody else. Um, just to update on three upcoming events, uh, the first of which is on November the 3rd. We've got a business networking uh, meet. It's a member networking meet um, and using the Zoom platform, the event will consist of two networking sessions. Attendees will be assigned a room for the first session uh, to network with fellow members from across the Thames Valley and then meet a new audience for the second session as they're assigned a new networking room. Uh, this event is open to all members and full details obviously on the Thames Valley Chamber website. On the 10th of November, we've got the Maximise Your Membership, and uh, you're invited to please join with us as we host a, a Maximise Your Membership event to help inform you about key information and ensure that you, your organisation and employees are fully briefed on all the benefits of Chamber membership. Again, full details on the website. Last but not least, on December the 3rd, we've got um, a 5G event and it's going to be looking at understanding the opportunity of now. And this is following on from the success of the recently critically acclaimed Windsor Debate Series. And we're delighted to present a virtual telecoms roundtable event. It's obviously a new world in just a few short months and we've seen the adoption of technology as has been previously referenced and it's been deployed at a pace not previously experienced. So we will gain further understanding of full fiber impacts and 5G rollouts, the digital economy, smart cities, digital infrastructure, digital inclusion and the evolving enterprise ICT landscape. All uh, digital champions and influencers that would have an interest in 5G are invited, of course, to register on the Thames Valley website. And that is coming down on the 3rd of December at 10 a.m. Look forward to joining you then. Over to you, Chris. Thank you. Adrian, thank you very much for that uh, that's an update. Let's hope uh, many of us are able to uh, to join uh, to join those events. Um, to conclude, and we're a little bit of uh, uh, ahead of time, which is always a good thing. Um, I'm going to hand over to our Chief Executive, uh, Paul Britton. So, Paul, over to you. Thank you, Chris. I'm sure, I'm sure being punctual is to do with your excellent chairmanship, so thank you for that. Um, so this is going to be a, uh, another series of thank yous, which I think is really important. And you heard Adam Marshall, uh, Director General for the British Chambers of Commerce, uh, share his reflections as well. I, my reflections from a... Thames Valley Chamber uh, perspective is a, is a huge thank you to all of you, our, our members. It, it's, it's not a, just about your, about your subscription contribution, but it is about um, uh, this uh, active, important uh, thought leadership that you're putting into sessions like today. And I, I do believe that's playing a key role in that community activity that Theresa May uh, talked about uh, earlier on. And is, um, it is your energy and support that is going to keep uh, business moving, uh, ladies and gents, in this uh, toughest of situations that we find as, ourselves in. But uh, uh, I, do, I do firmly believe that there is going to be reward at, at the end of this and that that's simply that the connections that we're building now are, are going to help us to, to restart and to rebuild uh, uh, quicker as well as we, um, as we battle our way through these uh, restrictions. Um, in, in truth, ladies and gents, just to close it, when I, and taking it back to the subject, uh, when I took on the role of chief executive five years ago and, and the responsibility for the 40 uh, people, 40 members of staff, 40 members of team that I, that I have here five years ago, uh, being quite frank with you, the, the mental health agenda just, just simply wasn't, um, wasn't on my, my radar. And um, uh, in taking ownership of this, this charter, as a chamber, we're pledging to do more. Um, we've been very careful within the charter um, to make sure that everything that is set out can be applied to businesses 
uh, of any size. I, I heard what uh, that very um, poignant question that was asked about, well, what about the smaller businesses? And, and I, I hope that you read uh, within that charter that these are really practical steps that everyone can take, every leader can take uh, in trying to, to drive real change through their organization. Um, and I am aware that that starts with a personal commitment. Uh, and that's my personal commitment as well, to be a, a better business leader, uh, to be a compassionate leader, as, you, as you've heard to, uh, today. So I, I, I'm really proud that uh, the Charter has been launched by Thames Valley Chamber. I'm proud that we're leading on this and uh, I'll be championing uh, its virtues to our, to our members and to the wider business community, but I'll also be championing it within the British Chambers of Commerce network as well. We're, we're one of 53 accredited chambers, so I'll be working closely with Adam Marshall to encourage other chambers where they're not already and, and, and some are uh, to really uh, to, to lead on this uh, and to help to make a difference. Uh, and my final thank you is, um, is, to, is to David, um, who you uh, will have heard and perhaps been as impacted as I was about his remarks at the, at the start of the session here, because in fact, my learning around the mental health agenda started with my, my first meeting with, with David. Um, when he uh, applied for his role here at the Chamber. I'm sure he's never looked back. Uh, and that was in December of, of 2018. And I asked David um, what he wanted to share with the business community that felt most important to him. And, and you've heard from David that he really did have um, something important to share around good mental health, both as, as you've heard as a, a husband, a father, a brother and a colleague. And it's been a pleasure to work with him on this. Um, as David set out at the start, we as an organisation are on this journey as well. Uh, we would class, class ourselves as a small business taking those steps. And my final call to action is to work with David, work with Claire, work with Thames Water, um, with the other uh, colleagues that have been involved in putting the charter together. Um, and I'm absolutely 100% uh, confident and believe it will have a real impact upon uh, our businesses as we as we. Um, pull ourselves through these challenging times. So uh, thank you all for, for, for joining us. Uh, and uh, I do believe with that, that it's uh, a closing the session. And so I do wish you all uh, a safe um, and uh, um, uh, well um, uh, foreseeable future. So thank you very much for joining us.